Okay, we're going to discuss some serpent worship, if you will, in ancient times and how far it goes back and symbology and things. I think it has an esoteric knowledge that uh, can be valuable today, definitely. Uh, here you can see a snake definitely right there out front. You can also probably see the maiden on the left here and how she has little snakes near her feet. There's another maiden sitting down. Behind her is the wolf Fafnir. This snake that's giant that's coursing around the whole thing and indeed the world tree and coming back around to the other side is Njorgenmander or Jormungandr. And the girl that's here that you see is actually Hell. And it's the reason that we call Hell, Hell. Uh, you think that a lot of the ancient Celtic things were lost in ancient times, but indeed our days of the week and all kinds of things I've shown you in a bunch of videos that I've done show you still connections to that. In fact, what we believe of as Hell is from the name of this girl who was supposed to escort people into the afterlife. We did a whole video about it. There's an ancient folklore where she was one of the... Uh, sacred princesses whenever they'd come all the way here and then due to something happened she didn't make it but she was supposed to herald on the rest of them and go to heaven and talk about it or actually not heaven if you will go to the afterlife much like a uh, Elysian Fields type situation so in uh, as I've shown also in other videos uh, so necessarily hell wasn't some burning bullshit crap thing that you think of it is nowadays but something quite different Anyhow, so if you look at this snake, there's a few things that you probably notice out of it, other than its gigantic size, which, uh, you know, puts it in another realm, of course. Somebody looking at this picture might think of, oh, Twilight and the giant uh, wolves that are there, and might think of Slithering and the giant snake that attacks the uh, prince at the end of it there. But that could be seen in a lot of things and whenever I tell you that uh, it surrounded me when I was a kid and it still does to this day in a lot of these videos I've talked about you can see it in those recent movies there but you can also go back and say well there was the howling and all these other movies that had that giant wolf and what about Conan and the giant snake and the snake thing that went with that and the cult that was almost even more telling well this is a painting back from 1900 so it's not something that we just find out now. In fact, it's something that keeps being smothered over and hidden and disregarded. And we've talked about that. But what else do you notice about this snake? Well, he uh, had a point on his nose and far too many teeth. Well, the point on his nose is actually an egg tooth. And it's supposed to help them bust out of an egg. Yeah, and the Omphalos is an egg wrapped in a snake situation, so it helps the whole thing. And why would a snake help anybody? Well, we're going to get into that. But also, notice he has far too many teeth. Doesn't just have the fang situation that people would talk about. And now instantly, visions that if you just put some wings on this thing in some way, he would be something like a dragon. Set that aside, but keep it in mind. And look at the patterns on snakes and some of the d weird oddities and the banding that's done on them. There's old witch tales that say that patterning on that is sacred geometry and it's hooked up with things. And that's why one reason that they're sacred and that you use them in magic potions and this type of stuff. And I was like, what? And there's like, you know, magic potions where you use a snake skin and use this and eye of newt and crap like that. And what is this? Well, there's also a, a deal where they say that, you know, the little cubes that are all over the snake and the pattern that goes on there may have led people originally in the idea from the ancient, ancient snake cults into tattooing later to make about patterns that were endearing to themselves, but much like that. And they even said, well, if you look at our skin, we have these little triangles, little scales, almost like that, but they're different, they're skin. But you could tattoo them and make patterns and so on like that. Doesn't necessarily follow exactly, but tattooing goes along with this too in these people. And so there is a connection, definitely, and it could be what they say. But that's hell right there. 
So when you go to hell, oh my gosh, who are you going to meet? No, it's the devil of that. Well, uh, uh, here, here she is. Let's just go on here and let's get into this a little bit and see if we can't clarify some things and make some connections like we usually do and uh, enlighten and bring light to the situation that we have. Tracing the origins of the serpent cult. In mythology, the serpent symbolizes fertility and procreation, wisdom. In fact, in the Bible, it says, be wise as serpents, death, and resurrection due to the shedding of its skin, which is not akin to rebirth. So, think, think of that on those lines, but also we've talked about in Gilgamesh's tale, whenever he got this plant that was supposed to give him elongated life, that they had these ideas that these snakes who would get grayish skinned and you always, maybe he's gonna die and he'd shed his skin and look brand new and be just a hair bigger and it would keep going and snakes had this perpetual growth too. Yeah, you know, they don't have a non-terminal growth phase or they have a non-terminal growth phase. In other words, they can really grow all the way throughout their lives. Sharks and some other creatures can, but you can put that into the aspect of the idea too. So almost like a butterfly becomes a cocoon, it can do this idea. And ideas for given mythology has weird things in it too that we could talk about where snakes, whenever they do, whenever they die, they turn into this and things that sound like phoenixes and stuff too. But, well, even in your Bible, there's brazen serpents and so on like that. But we'll kind of touch upon that, but try not to go too deep into that. In the earliest schools of mysticism, the symbol of the word, yeah, like the power word, was spoken in the Bible and so on. The bird word was the serpent. The light that appeared was metaphorically defined as a serpent called Kundalini, coiled at the base of the spine to remain dormant in an unawakened person, much like Jorgen Mander, as at the bottom of the roots of the world tree, which reaches into the underworld and the upper world and makes the connection and if it gets awakened in Ragnarok and the whole lot, well, well it's just divinity or awakening one's godhood and latent abilities came with the rituals and teachings brought about by the serpent people this was taking people from a point that they were not in control of their surroundings as much as they were just very shortly after and this comes from a time from well before even the last ice age ended to understand them we must look at the original serpents in China it was a male or female pair with human heads and serpent bodies named Fushi and Nuwa, who created the humans. In Sumer, it was the Anunnaki. Nin Hersog and her husband, Inki, were given the task of creating workers or people to do the bidding of the gods because they were in control somehow, something they themselves created. Inki is known to us as the serpent in Genesis, and I have a question on that, and we'll get to that in a minute. The one who gave us the ability to think and reason, and so was cursed by his brother Enlil for it. Now, I'll make another connection here. Whenever the Bible stories were taken, that's most people now and scholars and things have gotten deep enough into it to realize it came out of Babylon in a later time from these ancient stories they told. They were pretty much lost to people at that time. But we found them now in all these ancient tablets. And in doing so, we were able to realize, well, here's the flood story and everything else. And, oh, here's another one. Here's something like Genesis. Here's this. Here's that. Taking place of the snake was just a woman. That, of course, is the Eve story. It comes in there. But also that woman, 
and the Inanna priest, priestess has her own tale about Inanna and her sacred halupa tree and this problem that it had something to do with birds, which we'll get into slightly, and a serpent that's trapped into it, and they do to help her out, and so on. And it made a bond, and then here we go. So, that might clear up a little bit of things for you, how things got changed and twisted, but we'll get into it deeper, and some of these aspects I've already made whole entire videos out, and I don't want to go 40 minutes in, two paragraphs into a situation here. To the Hindus, though, it was the cosmic serpent Ananta who created us. So, at the dawn of man's creation, we have a pair of serpent-like beings who created us, and then those of the serpent cult must have been their direct descendants, either by blood or spirit. So there's something that has to do with that in the connective. Here we're seeing the ancient Chinese gods that they talk about. And on the left is a womanly aspect. And on the right is a male aspect, shown with his little mustache and so on going here. They're in a similar pose to each other. But notice how their left and right arms are locked together. Now, I did this with my brother before. We, we share a jacket, and if you've ever done this, and da da da, and it's like two people are one, and da da da. It's, it, uh, it, there, it has to do with that, but yin and yang, and so much more that's trapped in here, and there's a lot in this symbology. See what you see as I keep talking that I miss and put it down in the comments. But so what you see is somebody here, and it looks like they're wearing a dress, but then if you look further, no, no, they're not wearing a dress. In fact, this is more of a kilted out or like the bottom of a gi looks whenever you have a belt around it and so on. It's just flared out. It's not even a kilt type situation necessarily. And there are two legs that come down from this situation in this sacred Naga type serpent. As we go down here, maybe you'll notice that it becomes a helix where they wrap around each other, much like the building of rope or the braids. But this is also a healing aspect and this DNA, we find it in here and so on. So there's again a sacred geometry type of situation that's pulled into this situation somehow, right? Well, if we look a little deeper here, we'll notice that there are a bunch of little dots all over for some reason and they're connected. I played dot to dot when I was a kid, but I've seen a lot of this before and there's Orion in the bottom right hand corner. And there's the sacred triangle in the bottom left. In fact, there's that crescent symbol with ten around it. Right there, and that's God's thing. That's, uh, hmm. And there's a couple with angles, and a few that are interconnected, but you may not recognize them so much. But I'll be darned if that isn't the little dipper over there on the right. And on the left is a cluster, which would probably be much like the Pleiades, but instead it's built like a pyramid of stars. It comes out to uh, nine, and then above, as above, so below, we have something that doesn't symbolize the moon necessarily, but the sun, and it again has that same ten little stars around it. Some of it's smudged out over time. Other people might notice that this is a Tocharian type of dress that's going on here and the ancient weaving and we found this in burials that still existed to this day and even in China and there's been a bunch of pyramids and things that are found that are associated with these people and a dating and one time of doing genetics it was quite revealing let's just say but what else can you see here well they're in this little pose and they're spinning around each other, making this swirl, like the world spins round and round. The sun's up there, and the moon goes down, and the world spins round and round. Well, it's time for another lesson. Well, let's go to one more depth situation in this. For on our left, we seem to find a compass. Let me get out of the way, and we'll see that again. And that's very telling. 
with maritime people and astronomy and the way things go, but also with the Templars, Masons, and building situation. In fact, on the right, we have there a square. But if we pay attention, it's not necessarily a square. It's actually a level and a plumb bob situation. And you can use these together in a lot of situations that come across to more math type things. And so you might just see two people, a man and a woman, entwined as one doing this thing. If you look at it for a little bit longer, you might see a whole lot of different things. Tell me what I missed down there in the comments. Let me know. The next serpent was Inki's son, Ningishida, known, as the Sumeri known to the Sumerians, Egyptians, and Tibetans, and uh, kind of the Greeks too, huh? According to Zacharias Sitchin, I don't always, I don't like to embrace him, his sayings, but what does he say? Well, he dwelt in Megan. Yeah, people have looked at that as possibly being uh, off of the Red Sea, but not necessarily Egypt. But maybe down in the Horn area, or perhaps, which is close to Abyssinia, and Inki was attached to an abyss, and they say, you know, does, does this story they're talking about in the ancient thing go a little bit wider than just this little river that goes down here? I know the other one talks about Dilmun and so on, but, you know, if you go out Dilmun, and then you take a right, and keep going where you can end up, but now he says Megan is known as Egypt, that's Mitzrayim, but let's continue. Leading theorists though to believe that he was Thoth who was formed a who formed a mystery school propagating ideas of self improvement and enlightenment, furthering his father's deeds already in philosophy. Now if we take that statement and separate from the Sitchin concept and leave that statement out of this entire thing and go with it, what we have here is this Thoth, which was Ningashida and or Inki is accredited with a lot of his things, but it's as one as Thoth, and they both do uh, teaching of writing and so on like that. There's also Tautus the Phoenician, and a lot of people say that's actually from way back, and that was it. That's the same situation, but also then we have Hermes Trismegistus, and people have said, well, Ning Ningashida is Mercury, and they go, well, Mercury is Hermes. That's the messenger in ancient times, and that cognates to who? Thoth. So all these connections that we've made before come to light one more time, one more level, perhaps, if we see that and take out that one statement. But Ningishi ruled over Megan as is claimed, then that school would have been a beacon attracting all who wish to gain knowledge. Well, Thoth has come about and shows up prominent in the earliest of dynasties and is the inspiration for da 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 that leads to the pyramids and everything and people have said that's something they had from back before that but it ended up doing the thing that made the formation of it. But he's known to live for a long time because they keep talking or referring to him and being able to talk to him. A lot of people say this is a commune that's done with priests that pass through a lineage from way back when. If Inki and Nigashida ruled over Megan is claimed then they might have had that mystery school that's there. Well, there's lots of mystery schools that went around in each little place that helped to spawn it. And it actually has a formation that happens before that because in a lot of these cases, the first meeting is somebody who's quite primitive and not understanding. They'll get to that here in a minute. But is there any proof to that theory well we're talking about exceptions that can show you connections and there's a whole lot more that i could just keep going into and once you start looking here and it fills up the trash can and your cup overfloweth like hermes cup you say i at least give it some levity it was claimed by the council of nicaea that the power of gods came from egypt So 
just going to let that set in by itself for a second. There was a great white brotherhood. Now that's named for their raiment and stuff like that. It's not necessarily that. But you know, uh, let me back that off in a modern day where you've got to go, ooh, they were white people, of course. A prominent mystery school in Karnak, a branch of it became the Egyptian Therapeutidate, who Judea was known as the Essenes. Jesus being a scene, which are people like modern day Odessa and so on through that area, he was most likely though initiated in this Egypt at mystery school, rising up to the levels until he became a master. People have made a bunch of assumptions what happened to the theoretical Jesus during his childhood. And they have these ancient books that they threw out of the Bible that tell you weird stories and his playing around with his friend, he died, and he brought him back to life, and the kid freaks out, and everything, you know, all these different things that go along with it that probably happened to different people at different times, but let's just continue. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to even touch that. There's too much to go into here. We're talking about serpent worship, but then again, Jesus himself said, be wise as serpents, and when he came in and he rebuked the bullshit that was going on that you hear about, this might give you some light into the idea of what he knew about things, especially whenever he was telling other people they were liars. But now let's look at this here, and we see that these guys on the side are holding on to rods, which can specifically look like more modern swords stabbed into the ground or banners that are hooked up in some way. But in doing so, it's kind of two pillars. And we see in the inside of that, these two snakes intertwined. A lot of people recognize this as a DNA symbol, and a lot of people are hearing this. They're like, man, I've heard this so many times. But this is the Kadeshus symbol that we still even use today for healing and so on, and it always hooks up to Mercury. Even in the FTD florist, when they show Mercury, there he is with the thing. There it is. Yeah, and if you wanted to have another symbol for it and not even use this, you could just have a winged boot. But that'd be a little too telling, wouldn't it? But then again, using snakes right out in the open like this is kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of people have looked at stuff like this. And of course, we know the story of Ireland and the snakes and everything, but we'll get to that here shortly. These things around it, which are said to look very much like griffins, and we did a video even recently about griffins and how it carries through with these ideals. But if you look at it with these clawed bird or eagle type feet and claws that it's got onto it, does have elongated tail got a weird maw for a head horns even on it and wings that is a dragon oh it's a serpent don't well so are the things wind around the thing in the middle of it too so it's all about it somewhat if you will but the Sumerians show a bunch of different ones. Some look like giraffes and so on with a little forked tongue sticking out and everything. And people have known a long time ago, as a unicorn, this is a dragon. Eventually, the Anunnaki did lose control of the earth and its population, which is rapidly expanding. Or they were just directed to go out, and then the cultures that were associated with them disintegrated into the biggest population they were associated with as others evolved further as trade started going between them because in a lot of these situations you actually had to get them to the point of making something worth trading. With mankind scattered all across the globe, forming their own colonies and social structures, those who followed the serpent ideology would have been concerned with maintaining relevance while faced with constant change, new religions, and potential threats to their own land, which was wealthy. To both protect themselves and to encourage people to follow their belief system, they sent out emissaries known to some as the Watchers or the Shining Ones. And we find tales of these Shining Ones or Light Bringers the world over. To simple hunters and fishermen, they seemed like gods. 
They did not uh, come to conquer the lands, but rather to aid the people, teaching them how to cultivate crops, heal their sick and injured, and even read the stars. Now this is told out a bunch of places. One place you can see is Awanas and everything, and with this guy that comes out with his fish scale armor and so on. One weird, almost lost fragment of a ancient tale about this was that they came out of the water and the guys turned around and started shooting them with their arrows. That they came at them with, the translation is, I guess, with Ernst, or, you know, directly at them, walking, no stopping, even whenever all they varnished their arrows. You can figure that into it. They shot at them and it just bounced right off of them. Things like this is what in Dungeons and Dragons says, well, ma only magic weapons affect these things that are supposed to be like gods and stuff, but also, if they just had simply things and these other people had chain mail or plate mail, scale mail, dragon scale armor, if you will, it really makes them impenetrable unless you hit in a right spot. Simple one part like that, but these people that were talking about the world over. They would go around to different people and meet them and simple hunter and fishermen, of course to them they seemed like gods and stories became created and enhanced later by almost the same people still having constant contact back and forth. Very constant for a period of time and then trait and so on. But they didn't come to conquer those lands, even though those people that we're talking about quite often got pushed to the extremities of the known world. But almost given their own place, if you think and look about how the things came out. Numerous ancient cultures throughout the world worship the serpent, though. Beings such as Quetzalcoatl in Mexico and Peru, the Naga king of India and his Nagan children, Po Nagar in Vietnam, who was their first empress, and the serpent deities who were beautiful women associated with trees and lakes. The snake goddess of Egypt, Wajet, which Wajet means blue, as in the blue Wajet eye, was the protector of the land, kings and women in childbirth, in Manoa, the snake goddess was addressed as Asa Sarah Me. Asa, like in Clan of the Cave Bear, where they had developed an ancient dialect that people might have talked way back when, even pre proto Indo European type linguistics, in an envisioned language, and women in her Asa Sarah which sounds conspicuously like Ang, uh, Abraham's wife. Let's continue. But this was related to the Hittite Ishasara. Now, Isha is a woman, or Ishi, and Sarah is a sacred woman. This is sometimes looked as being pluralistic somewhat and used in more than one situation. So a lot of times they were saying, well, this is a sacred woman in that position. The Khmer have Apsara and the Canaanite Ashera. We know about the Semitic H and the sh sound. You take out that H and that's Asera. But we've shown how that is Estera, Istara, Inanna, Diana the Huntress, and so many connective ones. Pre-Christian Ireland also, Scotland and England worshipped serpents. Stide step here again like I always do and talk about everybody knows that St. Patrick kicked all the snakes out of Ireland. Well, there was never any snakes in Ireland. They can't find any bones ever. It never happened. Well, what is that? No, it's snake worship. In fact, you can still find remnants of where it used to go on and things that happened at that time. It was taken back over with Christianity. And Patrick comes to the root cognitive pater, which is father, as in pater, as in dios pater, 
sacred heavenly father or Jupiter. And that's where that comes from. It's connected. Got a lot of videos about it. Let's move on before I get stuck. Because don't want to get stuck. Would rather look at breasted women. Hey, so here we have this Minoan, ancient Phoenician type woman. And you can see her here holding the two snakes in control of them. Easily that's seen as snake worship. A lot of times she'll have a flame on her head or something else. But very intricate dress too. And some people gloss past all these type of things. But sometimes these snakes are a whole lot bigger. Sometimes they're longer in reach to top to ground. In fact, sometimes this pose here which is a form of the Master of Beasts, which we've done videos about and talked about a whole lot, that carries through a lot of these civilizations because of their founding, but it goes from way back before when these people that had been the Shining Ones had already become the Master of Beasts and so on and were passing it on and bringing another people up in different areas and that representation that goes along with it was carried with things like this far into the future. Sometimes those snakes get so big it turns into two pillars. Like as in Samson or the Hercules situation. Got a few more things I could say about this. Well, let's continue. However, visiting a figurehead was not enough to cement the serpent cult's position, especially when faced with new religions and kingdoms that were acquiring political and military might now. To that end, politically advantageous marriages were arranged with the emerging ruling families. A serpent prince or princess marrying into the family would bring trade, wealth, knowledge, and how to form a coherent society in the secrets known only to the cult which would then be passed down to the resultant children. It was this well of knowledge that gave the new ruling family the advantage over their people and allowed them to claim divinity or superiority over the others and their right to rule. Yet most of these marriages did not end happily. Well, they say yet most of them. It's like, no, actually most of them did end happily. We have examples of them where they didn't, and they seem so fervent. And not so much of the stories that went all happily. Well, a lot of things that went all happily didn't get written up about. And they lived happily ever after, dot, dot, dot. Where's the next tablet? Where is it? Well, there's a whole story about everything else. But this gets shown a lot of times where maybe things didn't happen right. Let's talk about a couple of those and so on. King Dutwabung of Burma had a Naga princess as a wife. The capital of Burma, Pagan, had Naga advisors and attendants. In some accounts, after failing out with his wife or falling out with his wife, he was said to have been killed by the Nagas. By some researchers, they've looked into this and they go, well, "Those are his concubines." And when they talked about he was bitten by a poison and the Zada, no, now that's uh, stabbed by poison daggers have been poisoned and so on. In fact, the dagger thing figures into it much easier. It wasn't that, but then it was kept as something else. Written a little way different. Less embarrassing, perhaps. And then, about what? Well, that's the thing that's lost. That was what was intended. Let's continue. In Laos, the tale was told of the Naga prince Pangink I who fell in love with the Khmer princess Akam. Wishing to have a glimpse of her but remain incognito, he turned himself into a squirrel, was unfortunately caught and eaten, because that's what the hell they eat. His father, the Naga king, waged war on the kingdom in retaliation, capturing the princess. King Padang, who was also in love with her, went to rescue her but was unsuccessful, becoming the ghost king in continuing the siege of the Naga King's capital. It's been a while since I brushed up on this, but I believe somebody had come up with the idea that, yep, this is all written in mythology, as I say, and just twisted around 
to where it comes out to this thing with this deal. Well, what's it got to do with everything? Notice how the Naga serpents and things are thrown right into it, and you even just brush right past them looking for something else. You can't see the trees right there for the forest. You're looking for a Christmas tree, and there's one right there. In Cambodia, it was Soma, like the sacred drink. I won't go there yet. The daughters of Naga, King Naga, who was captured by the Brahmin priest, Kondinya, who then married him. Her father sucked up the water from the swampy land, creating the country of Kampuchea for the couple. And again, here we have a connection into India and so on. So let's look at this and let's see what we notice. Well, there's a Celtic-like scrawling somewhat on the side that's there, but this is a Naga Sake Serpent. But make no bones about it. If you were to just take the very end of it and turn it into a fishtail, it's very similar to a mermaid by depiction. doesn't have quite the same connotations, but was carried by similar people. Let's just continue. We're a little too far away and not zoomed in on this picture, but... And, and it's worn away, but surely you can see that there's three cobras behind here. And then also it's showing there and holding it sacredly, pointing it out to you like, please observe. This is a conch shell, and we've talked about the sacred geometry of shells and so on. You can imagine someone in Booz's type teachings telling you, observe the conch shell. And comparing it to many other things. To some people, they'd be like, what's he holding a shell? To other people, like, no, he's something much different. They can be found throughout Asia, and so it shows connections and bringings of this knowledge from way back when. In Java, there's a story that bears some similarity to the Little Mermaid story. But this goes to a part two, it's in your top left-hand corner. Little Mermaid. It is the tale of Nya Lara Kedul, who was married to the human king. She was so beautiful that his other wives hired a witch to make her ugly. In despair, she jumped out into the ocean where the goddess took pity on her, turning her into a half-human, half-snake, and anointing her queen of the ocean. A lot of people in this area would say that that connects to a sea snake that's out there too. And also perhaps a large or the Java version of a moray eel. But again, married to a human king and so on. You'll find that these connective stories, by the way, whenever they come into each of these societies, one thing about it is it's a person from far away connecting to there and that was the start as if there was almost nothing before but this also whenever it keeps repeating itself in place it shows you a common connection for one thing let, let, let's just go on I could go off right there but in India, the serpent beings were known as Nagin, the children of the Naga king. Several royal families claimed lineage through intermarriage, and Nagin included the Manipur Yadivas and Pallavas. I, I, will, I will go ahead and, and speak now. So here we talk about some princess coming from a foreign land and everything, or prince coming from a foreign land, and there's a lot of girls that grow up with this ideal that someday my prince will come and this thing... And he's probably not from right around here. Well, these ancient cultures, a lot of them were Caucasian on a Caucasian, but not necessarily. Or what you would have considered that during different times here. In Greece, the most famous example is Alexander the Great, whose mother was an enthusiastic participant in Orphic rites. Often dancing with serpents draped about her in the fresco titled Zeus Seduces Olympias. 
by Guillo Romano, Zeus is a head and torso of a human, but the tail of a serpent. We glance past that Alexander Great, and he was supposed to have been half divine. He had half one blue eye and half that wasn't. Before we get to this next part, uh, let's see, we're right at 40 now, and it'll go to 45, and then I'll click, because that's a perfect point. Anyhow, um, let's view something here, and we'll probably start the next one with it, too. So, he had one blue eye, and it made him divine. What What is that? attached to what does that mean well and we've talked about India and the Orient and so on too if we were to simply look up blue-eyed gods I went to DuckDuckGo and went to images but if we were to look at this you could find that in the earliest of Egypt you'll find these crystal blue-eyed statues I'll show you a whole bunch more it's not just one there's a bunch of them it comes all the way through the 12th dynasty and they lose it but conspicuously later they have it in Nefertiti's statue that you can still see one blue eye on the left even though she's missing the one on the right. Regardless of that, the Sumerians start with blue-eyed guys that are here, but you can also find them around the world in bearded situations like Quetzalcoatl and then Mexico. But also Buddha is shown here also in a few different cultures is always depicted with a blue eye. In fact, one of the Qualifications for a great man in Buddhism, number 23, I think it is, is uh, blue eyes. Let's continue. There's a statue like this with its beard going on, and they figured out that's Narmer itself. But then again, what? Yeah, it's in the uh, British Museum, the Louvre. Everybody knows about it real good? Look up Narmer, Narmer uh, exhibit there, and you can find that. And that was supposed to have been the founder of ancient Egypt. But then again, we see that. In the first of Egypt, it has these statues. In fact, here I can find you. Here we go. Let's see if you can find blonde and auburn and red-haired Egyptians, but also these crystal-eyed statues that are here. And this is just a fragment of them. This statue here showing a real pale lady. Here, this is Nofret and Rahotep. But not only do they carry around these gods that have end up having blue eyes going on oh missed from Finch talking about in ancient Turkey in the Wayback Machine actually predates these but then there are these same statues that the eyeballs have fallen out on or whatever they don't have blue in them there anymore but it goes all the way back cattle Hoya and areas and go back to Tepe but they also carry with them these symbols and in all cases, the symbols mean very similar to the same thing, although maybe not as much. Knowledge goes with it in certain cases. It ends up being about the same way, and we're talking about around the world also. And what else can we see that go along with it? Like in Mayan, this blue-eyed mask here. He's the Lord of Sepan. Hmm. Here's one from my video. So if you look up just... Blue-eyed gods, you're going to see this. And this is the Nakata II period, before the pharaohs in Egypt. And they have found gold-plated little statues that were already being made by the artisans there that had handmade blue eyes in certain. It's not the only one either. There's more. There's more of the Sumerian-type statues that are here. But again, we were talking about this area over here near China. Well, here's these Terran Basin people. And they found them with these woven fabrics. In fact... A suit that's red it looks very much exactly like or very much exactly that didn't come right very much like that depiction we were looking at before with the two people that were twisted right this is in China right here Hong Shan culture 2500 BC and before a little bit this also is a pre-dynastic Egyptian. It has blue eyes in it. From the first inklings of art going on with it, here's a depiction of the bearded god Viracocha. Hmm. The natives in America do not grow facial hair. In fact, very few people grow facial hair naturally without some